This is the story of a man. The story of a man raised up by God in a time of spiritual and moral decline. The story of a man who would bring the nation of Israel back to God. But this is not the story of a warrior, a superhero, or even a king. This is the story of Elijah. Someone just like us. During the 38th year of the reign of King Asa of Judah, a man named Ahab became the king of Israel. Ahab was wicked and incited the wrath of God more than all the kings before him. He worshiped the false god Baal and built an altar and a temple to him in Samaria. During his reign, the city of Jericho was rebuilt, costing the lives of the builders' sons, fulfilling the prophecy spoken by Joshua. One day, Elijah came before Ahab with a message from God. As surely as the God of Israel lives, in the next years there will be a great drought. Neither rain nor dew will touch the earth unless I give the word. And then God told Elijah, Get out of here and fast. Head east and hide out on the other side of the Jordan River. I have commanded the ravens to feed you and you shall drink fresh water from the brook. Elijah did as God instructed, and sure enough, the ravens brought him food twice a day, and Elijah satisfied his thirst by drinking from the brook. Eventually, the brook became dry because of the drought, and so God gave Elijah new instructions. Get up and go to Zarephath. Do not leave there for any reason. I've instructed a widow there to take care of you. Elijah did as God instructed, and found the widow at the gates of the city, gathering wood. Please, bring me some water to quench my thirst. As she began to do so, Elijah also asked for bread. The widow said, I have no bread. In fact, I am starving. I have nothing except for a bit of flour in a bowl and a few drops of oil in a jar. I was gathering this wood? to make a fire so my son and I could eat one last bite of food and then die. It's all over for us. Elijah replied, do not worry. Go ahead and do what you've said, but first make some for me and bring it back here. Then you and your son may eat your own bread. God has promised your supplies will not run out before God sends rain on the land and ends this drought. The widow did exactly as Elijah had asked, and everyone who lived in her house had food for days. The bowl of flour and the jar of oil did not run out, just as God had said. Later on, the widow's son grew fatally ill. His sickness took a turn for the worst, and eventually he stopped breathing. The widow said to Elijah, Why did you come here, a so-called holy man, barging in, exposing my sins and killing my son? Elijah took the dead boy, carried him upstairs to his room, and laid him on his bed. Elijah prayed, Oh God, my God, why have you brought this terrible thing on this widow who has opened her home to me? Why have you killed her son? Three times, Elijah stretched himself out full length on the boy, praying with all his might, God, my God, bring this boy back to life. God heard Elijah's cry and brought the boy back to life. Elijah carried him back to his mother and said, here is your son alive again. Rejoicing, the widow said to Elijah, I see it all now, you are a holy man. The word of the God from your mouth is the truth.
A long time had passed when the word of God came to Elijah again. It was the third year of the drought. God said, Go now and reveal yourself to Ahab. I'm about to make it rain on the country. So Elijah went to reveal himself to Ahab. The famine was severe in Samaria, and Ahab had summoned Obadiah, his palace administrator, who was wholly devoted to God. Obadiah had experience giving refuge, food, and water to prophets in times of need. Ahab said to Obadiah, Search through the land. Locate every spring and every stream. Let's see if we can find enough grass to keep our horses and mules from dying. So they divided the country between them for the search. Ahab went one way, Obadiah the other. While Obadiah was exploring the land, he came across Elijah. Obadiah fell on his knees, bowing in reverence, and exclaimed, Is it really you, my master Elijah? Yes, it's really me, Elijah replied. Now, go and tell your king that you have seen me. But what have I done to deserve this? Obadiah asked. Ahab will kill me. He has searched far and wide for you. The minute I leave you, God will whisk you away somewhere else. Then, when I report to Ahab, you'll have disappeared, and Ahab will kill me. And I've served God devoutly since I was a boy. Don't you know what I have done for God's prophets? And now you want me to tell my king you've been found when he will surely kill me for it? Do not fear for your life, said Elijah. I will meet with your king today. So Obadiah went straight to Ahab and told him. And Ahab went out to meet Elijah. The moment Ahab saw Elijah, he said, So it's you, old troublemaker? I'm not the one who has caused trouble in Israel, said Elijah. You and your government have dumped God's ways and commands and run off after the local gods, the Baals. Here's what I want you to do. Gather all the people of Israel and send them to Mount Carmel to meet with me. I have a message for them. Be sure to gather all the prophets of Baal and the goddess Asherah, the ones who fill their mouths and stomachs with food from Jezebel's table. So Ahab summoned everyone in Israel, particularly the prophets, to Mount Carmel. Elijah said to the people, How much longer will you sit on the fence, refusing to make a decision between the Lord and Baal? If you believe God is the true God, then devote yourselves entirely to him. If you believe Baal is your master, then devote yourselves entirely to him. The people were silent. I am the last remaining prophet of God. Baal has 450 prophets. Let's do a little test. Bring us two bulls to sacrifice. Baal's prophets can pick one, butcher it, and lay it out on the altar on firewood but don't ignite it. I'll take the other one and lay it on the wood without lighting it. Then you pray to your gods, and I'll pray to my God. The God who answers with fire is the one true God. Everyone liked this idea. So Baal's prophets went first. They called upon Baal all day, crying out, Baal, answer us with fire! But there was no voice, no reply. Nothing happened. Desperate, they jumped and stomped on the altar they had made. At about midday, Elijah began making fun of them. You'll have to shout louder than that. Maybe Baal is having a nap. Louder! They prayed louder and louder, cutting themselves with swords and knives, a ritual common to them, until they were covered with blood. But still, there was no voice, no reply. No God heard them. Then Elijah said to the people, Now it's my turn. First, he fixed the now ruined altar with 12 stones, one for each tribe of Israel. Then he dug a wide trench around the altar. Then he poured four large buckets of water on top, drenching the bull and the entire altar. Then again, and then a third time, the water covered the altar and even filled up the trench. Finally, Elijah called out to God. O oh God, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, 
make it known right now that you are God in Israel, that I am your servant, and that I'm doing what I'm doing under your orders. Answer me, God. Oh, answer me and reveal to these people that you are God, the true God, and that you are giving them another chance at repentance. Immediately, the fire of God fell and burned up the offering, the wood, the stones, the dirt, and even the water in the trench. And all the people saw it happen and fell on their faces in awe and worship, exclaiming, God is the one true God! God is the one true God! After the prophets of Baal were massacred, Elijah said to Ahab, Up on your feet, eat and drink, celebrate. Rain is on the way. I hear it coming. The drought had continued for three years now, and Ahab remembered what Elijah had said back at the start. There will be a great drought. Neither rain nor dew will touch the earth unless I give the word. This was it. Elijah was giving the word. Baal, the god of rain, had been defeated. So Ahab did as Elijah said and got up and ate and a drink. Meanwhile, Elijah climbed to the top of Mount Carmel, bowed deeply in prayer, his face between his knees. Then he said to his young servant who was with him, Quick, look toward the sea. The servant looked but saw nothing. Keep looking, said Elijah, seven times if necessary. And sure enough, the seventh time the servant said, Wait, I see a cloud, a very small cloud rising out of the sea. Go quickly then and tell Ahab, Get moving down from the mountain before the rain stops you from traveling. Things happened fast. The sky grew black with monstrous clouds. The wind grew wild. The heavy rain fell, and Ahab traveled quickly in his chariot to Jezreel. The strength of God filled Elijah, and he hiked up his robes and ran in front of Ahab's chariot all the way to Jezreel. When Ahab arrived in Jezreel, he told Jezebel everything that Elijah had done, including the massacre of the prophets. Jezebel immediately sent a messenger to Elijah with her threat. The gods will get you for this, and I'll get even with you. By this time tomorrow, you'll be as dead as any one of those prophets. Terrified, Elijah ran for his life to Beersheba, far in the south of Judah. He left his young servant there and then journeyed into the desert for one day and collapsed in the shade of a broom tree. There he prayed for God to just end his life until he fell asleep. Suddenly, an angel shook him awake and said, Get up and eat! He looked around and to his surprise, right by his head were a loaf of bread baked on some coals and a jug of water. He ate the meal and went back to sleep. The angel returned, shook him awake again, and said, Get up and eat some more. You've got a long journey ahead of you. He got up, ate, and drank his fill, and set out. Strengthened by the meal, he walked for forty days and nights all the way to the mountain of God, to Horeb. When he got there, he crawled into a cave and went to sleep. Then the word of God came to him. So, Elijah... What are you doing here? I've been working my heart out for God, said Elijah. The people of Israel have abandoned your covenant, destroyed the places of worship, and murdered your prophets. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me. Then Elijah was told, Leave this cave and go stand on the mountainside in my presence. A hurricane wind ripped through the mountains and shattered the rocks, but God was not in the wind. After the wind, an earthquake shook the ground. 
but God was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a great fire, but God was not in the fire. Finally, when the winds calmed and the ground ceased to quake and the last ember of fire burned itself out, a calm, cool breeze brought a gentle whisper to Elijah's ears. So, Elijah, what are you doing here? As I said before, I've been working my heart out for God, said Elijah. The people of Israel have abandoned your covenant, destroyed the places of worship, and murdered your prophets. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me, and they won't stop until they do. God replied, Go back the way you came through the desert to Damascus. There I want you to anoint Hazael as Aram's king, Jehu the son of Nimshi as Israel's king, and Elisha the son of Shaphat to replace you as prophet. Meanwhile, I am keeping for myself the 7,000 Israelites who have not bowed down to Baal. Elijah journeyed to find Elisha, the son of Shaphat. He found him in a field where there were twelve pairs of oxen hard at work plowing. Elisha was in charge of the twelfth pair. Elijah wrapped his cloak, his token of spiritual power, around Elisha. At once, Elisha abandoned his oxen and chased after Elijah. Elisha called after him, Please, let me tell my father and my mother goodbye. Then I will follow you. Go ahead, said Elijah. But mind you, don't forget what I've just done to you. So Elisha returned, killed his oxen, prepared a fire, and cooked all the ox meat. He offered the food to everyone in his family, and they feasted. After the feast, Elisha joined Elijah, becoming his right-hand man. Naboth, the Jezreelite, owned a vineyard in Jezreel that bordered the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. One day Ahab spoke to Naboth, saying, Your vineyard is near my house. Why don't you hand it over to me so I can make a vegetable garden out of it? I will trade you a better vineyard for it, or I can pay you if you prefer. But Naboth told Ahab, Not on your life. So help me God, I never sell the family farm to you. Frustrated and upset by Naboth's reply, Ahab went back into his house. He went to bed that night without eating anything. Jezebel, his wife, noticed his sour mood. She said, What is wrong with you? Why are you not eating anything? This isn't like you. He told her, Naboth refuses to give me his vineyard. I even offered to give him a different vineyard or to pay him. Jezebel said, Are you not the king of Israel? Is this any way for a king to act? Up, on your feet, eat. Don't worry, I'll take care of this. I'll get his vineyard for you. So Jezebel composed some letters, signed them with Ahab's name, pressed his seal on them, and sent them to the leaders and noblemen who lived in the city with Naboth. She wrote, Call for a fast day and put Naboth at the head table. Have two worthless men with questionable morals sit before him. Instruct these men to accuse Naboth of blasphemy against both God and the king. After this testimony has been given, take Naboth outside and stone him to death. And they did it. The leaders and noblemen of the city followed Jezebel's instructions precisely, and they had Naboth stoned to death. When Jezebel heard that her plan had worked, she told Ahab, 
Go for it, Ahab. Naboth is dead. His vineyard is yours. At once, Ahab set out for the vineyard and claimed it as his own. Meanwhile, God visited Elijah and instructed him to go and confront Ahab. When Elijah reached the vineyard, he said to Ahab, What's going on here? First murder, then theft? This is God's message to you. The very spot where the dogs lapped up Naboth's blood, they'll soon lap your blood as well. Ahab answered Elijah, My enemy, you've discovered what I've done. Yes, I've found you out, said Elijah, because you have sold your soul to wickedness in God's eyes. God will most certainly bring doom upon you. He will wipe out your descendants and cut you off from everyone in Israel, leaving you completely alone, all because you've made God so angry by causing Israel to sin. Dogs will devour Jezebel and anyone tainted by Ahab. Ahab, pushed by his wife Jezebel and in open defiance of God, had set an all-time record committing evil in the eyes of God. He had been incredibly wicked, indulging in idol worship and other terrible atrocities. When Ahab heard what Elijah had to say, he ripped his clothes to shreds and dressed himself in sackcloth. He fasted, rested in depression, and kept quiet. Then God spoke to Elijah. Have you witnessed Ahab's repentance? He has shed his pride and wickedness and humbled his heart before me. Therefore, I will not send evil against his house while he is still alive. Instead, I will send it during the lifetime of his son. After Ahab died, the Moabites rebelled against Israel. One day, Ahab's son, King Ahaziah, fell through the balcony railing on the rooftop of his house in Samaria and was injured. He sent messengers off to ask Baalzebub, the god of Ekron, Will I ever recover from this accident? Meanwhile, one of God's angels spoke to Elijah, saying, Up on your feet. Go out and meet the messengers of King Ahaziah and ask them, why are you going to ask Baalzebub about the king's healing? Do you believe there is no God in Israel? Tell Ahaziah that he has made his bed, and now he must lie in it. He's as good as dead already. Elijah delivered the message, and the messengers went back to the king. The king said, Why are you back so soon? They told him, A man met us and asked us if we were consulting Baalzebub because we believed there was no God in Israel. He says you're as good as dead. The king said, Tell me more about this man who said these things to you. What was he like? Shaggy, they said, and wearing a leather belt. That has to be Elijah. So Ahaziah dispatched 50 soldiers to confront Elijah on the mountain. The captain said, Hello there, O holy man. The king has a message for you. He says, come down from there. Elijah said, If it's true that I am a holy man, let me prove it to you. Let lightning from heaven strike you and your fifty men. And as the words left his mouth, lightning struck and incinerated the captain and his men. King Ahaziah sent another fifty men, and they too were incinerated by lightning. So he sent a third group of 50 men. The captain of this group fell on his knees before Elijah and begged him not to incinerate him and his men like he had done to the others. The angel of God told Elijah, Follow this man down the mountain and do not fear him. And so Elijah went with the man to the king. Elijah said to King Ahaziah, because you sent messengers to consult Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, as if there were no god in Israel to whom you could pray, you'll never get out of that bed alive. Ahaziah met his death 
just as Elijah had said. Ahaziah did not have a son. So Jehoram inherited the throne during the second year of the reign of Jehoram, son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. On the day that God planned to take Elijah up into heaven, Elijah and Elisha were leaving Gilgal, and Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here. God has sent me on an errand to Bethel. Elisha said, Not on your life. I'm not letting you out of my sight. So they went to Bethel together. The prophets at Bethel met Elisha and said, Did you know that God is going to take your master away from you today? Yes. Elisha said, I know it, but I want you to keep quiet about it. Then Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here. God has sent me on an errand to Jericho. Again, Elisha said, Not on your life. I'm not letting you out of my sight. So they went to Jericho together. The prophets at Jericho came to Elisha and said, Did you know that God is going to take your master away from you today? Yes, Elisha said. I know it, but please keep quiet about it. Then Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here. God has sent me on an errand to the Jordan River. Yet again, Elisha said, Not on your life. I'm not letting you out of my sight. And so the two of them went on their way together. While they were standing near the Jordan River, 50 of the prophets in that area stood at a distance on the other side. Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, and hit the water with it. The river parted, and the two men walked through on dry land. When they reached the other side, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what it is you would like me to do for you before I am taken away from you. Elisha said, Let me inherit a double proportion of your spirit. I want to be a holy man just like you. That's a hard one. Elijah laughed. But if you're watching when I'm taken from you, you'll get what you've asked for, but only if you're watching. And then it happened. A chariot and horses of fire appeared between them, and Elijah went up in a whirlwind to heaven. Elisha saw it and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel! When Elisha could no longer see anything, he grabbed his robe and ripped it to pieces. Then he picked up Elijah's cloak that had fallen from him, returned to the shore of the Jordan, and stood there. He took Elijah's cloak, all that was left of Elijah, and hit the river with it, saying, Now, where is the God of Elijah? Where is he? When he struck the water, the river divided, and Elisha walked through. The prophets saw the whole thing from where they were standing, and they said, The spirit of Elijah lives in Elisha! They welcomed and honored him, saying, We're at your service. We have 50 reliable men here. Let them go and look for your master. Perhaps the Spirit of the Lord has picked him up and set him down on some mountain or in some valley. No, Elisha replied. Do not send them. But they pestered him until he caved. So the 50 men went off, searching high and low. Nothing. Finally, they returned to Elisha in Jericho. He told them, didn't I tell you not to go? Elijah is gone from the earth.